Hey, this is D. Good morning, August 19th, 2023. It's early here in Tennessee. It's quiet. It's quiet near the mountains. I'm reading from Luke 2. hinging off of something I shared yesterday about what was spoken to Mary, who carried Christ. Um, I read the Bible on a deeper level than I used to when I was in religion. I read it um, metaphorically and mystically and see myself in all of the Bible. I see the Bible as my soul path and personally, I feel the Bible has opened and deepened tremendously since God, the Holy Spirit, has opened it to me this way on a deeper, much deeper level. Mary, who carries Jesus Christ in her womb, is told by the prophet Simeon, In Luke 2, his father and mother marveled at what was said about him, and Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel. Israel, I see as, um, again, we're all, in my opinion, we're Everything in the Bible is us in some way, okay? It's ourselves. It's our soul path. So Israel is the land of God in here. Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign that is opposed and a sword will pierce your own soul also. So that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. Wow. Let's read it from the Berean Bible, which I love. <sighs> the prophecy of Simeon. Now there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. The Holy Spirit had revealed to him that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Led by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and blessed God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother were amazed at what was spoken about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, Behold, this child is appointed to cause the rise and fall of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul as well. If we go down, Jesus is born in this chapter. He's born and he's about 12, I think, and they can't find him. I love this part. <clears throat> it's just blasting revelation and they're looking for him for three days. When they could not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. Finally, after three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers. And I love that. He's in the temple courts at first when he's young. And if we look at that mystically and metaphorically, when Jesus is young in us, when the Christ appears to us, he's first in the temple courts. We meet him on the outside of the temple, the most outer part. But through our soul journey, we were taken into the inner courts, the deeper places in our soul path. And here is Christ speaking to his parents. Why were you looking for me? 
he asked, did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement he was making to them. Wow. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for your revelation. Thank you that the layers of the realms that go deep into our soul go just as high and wide into the heavenly realms with you, as deep as we will travel in our soul, is as high as you take us in the heavenly realms, Lord God. If we will go authentically with your Holy Spirit, if we will travel in truth, you promise your word, your law is perfect. It perfectly promises us that we will ascend into heaven's realms with you. As we go into the inner courts of the temple, you will meet us there at the Ark of the Covenant, the most deepest place where your presence abides. And here is Christ saying, why would you look for me? You must know that I will be at the temple in my father's house. Who is my father's house? Who is this temple? God does not look on the outward 3D appearance. God's mind is much higher and he looks upon the inner man. If we want to find the Christ, we must go within. We must go into the world and travel into the world inside of us and bring the gospel to all nations, which we bear deep in the recesses of our DNA, so that you may transform us by renewing. not condemning, but renewing God through the truth. And we also are Mary housing in the womb of our being, the Christ. We house and, and womb the Christ in so many ways throughout this life. As you spoke to me about my own son, that his very presence in this world would be as Christ and would bring the rise and fall of many. It would convict many hearts, but it also would pierce my own soul. Wow. Because I needed my soul to be pierced. Speak to us this day, Holy Spirit, about suffering. There is a worldly mindset about suffering that somehow we can be in this world and not suffer. Why is it that the most awakened souls are present in their suffering and have traveled with you through the soul? in suffering and have found you. How can we forgive except that we be violated and hurt and broken by another? That is suffering. How can we learn patience and perseverance then that we are given circumstances that cause us to have to wait, to have to be patient, to have to persevere? How can we become like Christ than that we must continually take this journey of surrendering the ego in this world through suffering? The word says... In Romans 5, it confirms this. We have to suffer. 
but not as victims. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. There is deep revelation in the Bible. It is a mystical book for me. It has deeply changed me on so many levels and continues to meet me on many levels. I woke up this, <laughs> this morning. I can't talk and drink at the same time. Everybody knows this about me. Um, I woke up this morning and the Holy Spirit said to me, why is it in our human nature to protect others from suffering? When I have ordained you to be in this world of suffering, and that sounds really sadist without the mind of Christ. You know, we see a lot of parents who kind of put their kids on a pedestal and they don't want them to suffer. They don't want them to trip and hurt their knee. They don't want them to feel any pain at all. And they just kind of want to keep them in this bubble of just they're amazing and awesome and don't let them feel any pain. I don't want them to hurt. Um. When we gain the mind of Christ, we get past that veil of earthly thinking and realize that our children will never progress into higher realms of consciousness, awareness, um, death to the ego, unless they suffer. And so the more that we pad them as they get older and protect them falsely, we are actually doing them an injustice. And the reason that we do that is because of ourselves. If we get down to it, we realize it's, it's something in our own soul that is the reason we're doing that. And we, you know, I ask God a lot about narcissism because for so many reasons, but right now in the scope of humanity, there is something happening in the spiritual realms. Time, I, I mean, you talk to anybody, uh, so many people now realize that something happened to time. We, we can't explain it, but we can feel it. And so some kind of time warp has opened up. God is pulling us into the future and yet going back and bringing us into this valley of decision. And here are the multitudes of our generations in valley of decision. Those who have gone before us because we carried them in us. We carry the world in us. We also carry the Christ in us. In my opinion, these videos are about my journey and I'm not trying to put my beliefs on you. I'm just sharing where I'm coming from, but I'm getting somewhere with this. And so familial iniquity is coming to the surface in a very strong way right now. Whereas in years past, it was covered up and that had to be part of the timeline. It had to be covered up. It had to be, you know, concealed to bring us to this place it was wrong for it to be concealed but it but it for whatever reason god allowed that shame 
pride. That's why we cover up the family stuff, right? Shame and pride. So right now, here we are sucked into this valley of decision and the multitudes of our familial iniquity and our familial generations somehow are kind of crying out from this valley in suffering. It's kind of a a valley of hell. That's how I see it. It's like all the hellish realms that our familial lines have cried out from in their iniquities, their sins, the ones that have not been dealt with. And so we're hearing the realms of hell crying out and suffering in gnashing of teeth. And I'm acknowledging that here on this channel outwardly because that's where I am with my familial lines. And in the dynamics of the family, I was talking yesterday about the different basic psychological positions in families that we have. But there's always a narcissist in the family and there might be more than one narcissist, but there are key roles. And I, and I realized yesterday that God allows this, God allows there to be a narcissist in the family, a main character, a main role that plays the narcissist. And everybody does dance around, walk on eggshells, um, doesn't want this person to suffer. However, this person will come from a place of victimhood and is always the victim and has suffered the most out of everybody. And that is the that is the mindset of a narcissist. It just they truly believe that they have suffered so deeply and no one could even compare with how they've suffered. They cannot empathize. That's the thing. They lack empathy. They cannot see, touch, or feel the suffering of others. They, they know how to act on the outward. They study behavior. They are um, masters at it. They can act. And that's what this whole world system of acting is trying to show us, that we can act. But a narcissist cannot truly, authentically feel the empathy, put themselves in another's shoes, in another's position, and actually feel pain for another person of what they might be going through or have gone through. Everyone else is invisible or they have a twofold purpose. They're invisible, first of all, but they're also used for narcissistic supply, which means that they have to feed the supply of the narcissist's ego. And so, I mean, I'm not going to get into a whole psychological study about narcissism here right now. I've talked about it a lot before, but there's so much that can be spoken about it. And we can see um, narcissism in the Bible, if we want to see it on a spiritual level through the word of God. Um, through the Pharisees, we can see narcissism. We can see it through Jezebel. We can see it through Leviathan. We can see it through many of the characters shown in the Bible. Um, Judas, to some degree, the betrayer, um, who ended up in great suffering and ended up killing himself. Um, we could see it through Saul, who hated David. Um, I love how, even though Saul hated David, David kind of just kept running from Saul and trying to get away from him. And God was just teaching David so much. David was so in touch with his own soul and his own heart, even though he made so many mistakes, he would not move out of truth. Yes, he had his moments of deception like any of us, but that's why the Bible says, you know, have a heart like David. You know, we should pray for a heart like David. But how David continued to minister to Saul, even while Saul was trying to pursue and kill him, David, just by being himself, being who he was in the spirit, being who he was in his walk, in his path, would continue to minister to Saul and would calm the demons 
of Saul would actually calm the demons just by David being who he was. Meanwhile, Saul hated David. Deep down inside, Saul hated David. But he would calm and minister to Saul, even while they were in this whole dynamic of Saul pursuing David, wanting to kill him and hating him. David's just walking out his path and he's ministering to Saul at the same time. That is a miracle. That's how God works through us. People that hate us, pursue us, are jealous of us, want us to be dead, whatever, wish the worst on us. We actually could just continue to walk out our path and be ministering to the demons. We could be ministering to the, we're not ministering to the demons, but we're calming, we're, we're helping them find a deliverance through the power of the Holy Spirit working through us while we're just walking out our own path. That is God. That's how God works miraculously. We just keep going. We just keep following the Lord. But there is a narcissist in every family and they are always the victim. And they are always, um, everybody just kind of is taught to don't let them feel any pain. And even if you have to lie, which that's, that's the challenge, because if you're going to be close to the narcissist, you're either going to have to lie or you're going to become the scapegoat. You will become the enemy. <clears throat> Maybe that's why part of why Saul hated David. Saul hated David's heart because it was pure and David wanted to do the will of God. David wasn't focused on position or um, wanting to be king at all. He was off in the shepherd shepherding fields, just taking care of sheep. Um, and he was just ministering to the Lord out in the field. That's why I see his focus wasn't on becoming or being anything in the limelight. And Saul was focused on all those things. That's the narcissist. And, um, they want to be the center of attention, even if it if it's around them being the victim. And I feel there is a tremendous power that has come to this earthly realm in the spirit. It has, it is coming to blast through narcissism. It's it's coming to that dynamic in families. It's revealing it. It's been revealing it for the last few decades. And it's a grace of God, a gift of God that is coming to reveal that there is deliverance for this. Not just for the narcissist, but for those who have catered to the narcissism and why we have catered to the narcissism. We all have narcissism in us because we have an ego. But for those who are aware of their ego and who are allowing their ego to be crucified, they coming under the submission of the Holy Spirit, an awareness, a self-awareness. See, that's the self-awareness that we want to walk in. That's the awakening. Um, we will suffer when we let our ego die continually. We will suffer. The narcissist will not suffer, um, will not let the ego suffer. That's the thing. The ego is the fuel for the narcissist's um, existence, the whole dynamic of the narcissist and around their life. The ego is central. It's central. And so God is saying that there is tremendous power right now being released to deliver narcissism and also to deliver those who are in bondage to narcissism in any way and it is being revealed through the family iniquity and a, and a sword will pierce our own hearts and souls if we're going to walk in the truth. And so I bring it back to suffering because a sword that pierces our own soul is going to bring suffering. And when a family is taught to 
cater to a narcissist. It's like when we're, we're taught not to let them suffer, so we do everything for them. And we we pet them and we stroke them and we tell them nice things and we um, let them stay in their delusion. We don't bring out the truth. Um, we don't want any outbursts. We don't want any breakdowns. We don't want any... Um, And this is the same thing that I was just talking about with, with our children. If we don't want them to feel any pain, it's the same thing. We are promoting the ego in our kids. We are promoting the narcissist in our child. Um, give us wisdom, Holy Spirit, in this hour. You know, if we're going to go, if we're going to step into truth around a narcissist, there will be flying monkeys, as they call it in psychology, which are just all the people that kind of do nice to the narcissist. They just, they, they're they so afraid. They're just totally in fear. Totally in fear. There's just a root of fear. And I've been there. Um. But if we are one who will not cater anymore to the narcissist and we've come out of fear and we've come into truth, then we will be seen as evil. You know, they will call good evil and evil good. We will be seen as evil. We will be seen as um, making waves, rocking the boat, all of that. But we have to be in check with our own hearts because it's going to bring up things in our own hearts, our own evil. We will come face to face with our own heart and our own evil within us. And it's going to bring us into deeper self-awareness. There is no way to be in a family dynamic with a narcissist without having our own junk come up. Absolutely no way. And so God has allowed it. God has allowed this so that it can bring up our own stuff. This is why there is a great massive move of masculinity in the earth because so many men have succumbed to um, not leading women they come under the narcissism in females. They come under fear. They don't lead. They dance around. Um, they subjugate. They usurp. They allow their authority to be usurped. And the female is the dominant one. And the males just have subjugated just have you know bowed before these women but deeply hate and despise deep 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 down they hate and despise it because they know that they are supposed to lead how you know how do we recover from that how do men come out of that god is restoring the divine feminine god is restoring the divine masculine right now there is a grace there is an outpouring of the holy spirit for grace for healing, for deliverance. And the first step is acknowledgement, having eyes to see, no longer allowing the pride and the shame to blind us and the fear, the pride, the shame, and the fear. That three-fold cord, pride, shame, and fear. There is a, a sword coming to cut that. It's a sword coming to cut that cord, that rope that has held us around the neck, pride, shame, and fear, and bondage to the narcissism of the ego, the ego in us and the ego in others, pride, shame, and fear. Is God bringing up pride, shame, and fear in your life? Is God bringing up pride, shame, and fear having to do with narcissism around your family? 
David ran from Saul. And when he cut off the corner of his robe in the cave, he cut the little corner off of the robe. He let he let Saul know, but then his heart was convicted. His heart was so convicted. And that's so beautiful. But David knew, oh man, what is resident in my heart? Because I could have killed you, Saul, but look, I only cut the corner of your robe off. But he was gloating. And basically, you know, bragging. And David knew that there was wickedness in his own heart. I have to put the air up, excuse me. And so God is also in this moment of the corner of the rope, which David cut off and gloated about. What was that about? That was about his own ego. God wants us to be so self-aware to go into the world inside of us and find the great I am that I am who came to deliver us out of this world, to cleanse our hearts and to give us the mind of Christ. Everything, everything, everything is used for the kingdom. God wastes nothing because he loves us so much. What's happening in your family? What's happening in your heart? What sword is piercing your own soul? Are you a narcissist? God can deliver you through self-awareness. If you are a narcissist, you need raw truth. You need raw truth. Truth will deliver a narcissist, but it's going to piss them off big time. I don't know who I'm speaking to right now, but if you know you are a narcissist, you know it. The best thing that you could do is have two or three people that really love you sit with you, tell you the truth. You know, I thank God for my husband, and I've said this before, because he does not hold the truth back from me. And along the way of my marriage, it has pissed me off, man. <laughs> it's such a, I'm sorry, I'm saying that in such a masculine way, but God has to restore the divine feminine in me too. That's the rough side of me. Oh, it has angered me. It has, the little girl in me has kicked and screamed and not wanted to hear it. My husband was never, ever afraid to tell me the truth. Never, never. And in my opinion, he did not cater to my emotional breakdowns or he was not afraid for me to feel suffering. He was not afraid for me to feel suffering. And God is refining him in learning how to devotedly treasure my heart, my emotions, my feelings, and what I'm going through. God is teaching him in our older age now. Seriously, he is refining my husband. But that's coming through also the work God is doing in me to submit in divine femininity to my husband. And I'm learning that through other avenues. But it's a process. But I feel like I have a good foundation because my husband never danced around me. He never had eggshells that he, you know, he would not. 
he would not walk on eggshells. He wouldn't do it. He wasn't going to do it. Um, he spoke the truth. And it really, um, I guess God knew that I needed that from the beginning of my marriage. I needed that or I was going to go into narcissism that was going to kill me. It was going to take me to hell. My husband's strength delivered me out of that black hole. And I thank God for that. As much as my lower mind thought I wanted a man who would cater to me in that way, God knew what I needed. And deep, deep down in my heart, I was praying for the will of God. I was praying for the truth. I can say that with all my heart. I've been praying for that since a young girl. See past my own heart, God. See past my own motives. Let me be purified. That has been my prayer since I was young. And even to my own hurt, let circumstances occur, God, that will keep me in the path of holiness and deliverance and continue to deliver me out of deception and delusion. We have to pray that way. We have to. Or we will lean into the ego and into self-deception. Mary said, let it be so according to your word, O Lord. If a sword has to pierce our own soul with the truth, because in the word we see that the sword is the is the truth, the sword of truth. If that sword of truth has to pierce our own soul, let it be so, according to your will and according to your word. Amen. <laughs>